I'm Alan Fleury of the Franklin College of Arts and Sciences. Joining us on this episode of Unscripted is choreographer Liz Lerman. Her extraordinary ability to bring people together of different occupations and generations in the context of dance has made her a unique artistic presence. So your, your, your career has spanned, to me, is what, what is perhaps the greatest divide, and that's between artists and non-artists. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you, are, is it something you're doing every day in every place you go, is imparting these artistic values or aesthetic values or creative values to people who don't necessarily make things? I, I like to talk about um, artistic practice and its power, but I like to do it more. Mm -hmm. Which So if I'm working or if I'm in the vicinity of people who don't consider themselves artists, it's very nice to find a way to convey the power of the artistic tools in a way that um, can be useful to them. So sometimes it can be as big an idea as the idea of rehearsal. Like, I don't understand how people get through life without rehearsing. Right. I just don't get I mean, you have drafts when you do your writing. You have rehearsal drafts, Certainly. you know? You have, you know just what, what is that like, and what would it look like in someone's world? So it, it could be something as, as that, like that, or it might be a, a transition kind of, uh, a translation kind of thing that someone might be interested in. It might be that, um, for example, <clears throat> in, in institutions, People can work side by side for years and not know anything really about the people around them. I was called in to do a, a, a lunch talk at the Department of Education. It turns out the Department of Education in, in Washington, the workers there have the score the lowest on feeling good about their jobs. And I came in to do two things. But in this first was a leadership meeting over lunch. So the room, I don't know, the room was just full of and I asked everybody this question. I said, who in your ancestry um, was either, you know, taught you about leadership because they were, in, or who in your ancestry turned you on to ideas about educating, learning? Mm -hmm. Well, I thought we would go like, do, 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 and we'd be done, and I would start talking. Right. <laughs> Fifty minutes later, and each one is standing up and saying, these incredible stories about their great grandfather who came over and did this, and someone on the other side of the room said, "You're kidding! Your grand, my grandfather did, you know." So there was just this. Um, I mean, I didn't do another thing. That's all I did that day, and yet you knew that everybody walked out of there totally in a different place than they were. So what about that as an artistic practice? Well, it's drawing on personal story. It's drawing mm -hmm. on memory. Right. It's asking people to express. It's it's asking people to. Um, uh, dig in and tell the detail of something and make a connection to their lives now. These are things that you know artists do all the time, but and I um, mean it was profound what happened. That's an example. I, as I said, I didn't have to work very hard. Now at the shipyard, that's another thing. The shipyard took a little bit of work, but you know, even there, the, once, once it was determined that we were going to do this project, one of the things we did one day was to walk around uh, the shipyard just to sort of get a feel for it. And, the guys that were, they, they had one of the, they call them boats, even though they're some of these giant, giant right, things, they call right. them a boat. And they're in, it was in its harbor. Uh, and the, one of the guys comes out, he says, you know, I've always, it's an amphitheater, kind of. He said, I've always thought my work, I'm on stage when I'm fixing the boat. See this? And you look up and you're in this big, big amphitheater. He goes, see that? I've always just, you know, he sort of whispers to me, I've always thought I was on stage. I don't think he would have had the thought if he was talking to uh, a, a journalist or a poet. It's because he's talking to me, mm -hmm. a performer, that he acknowledges this thing that he's had, you know, all that time. I love stuff like that. I just love that. And of course, it, it, it's, it changes my view, too. Of course. Of the world. It changes me in that moment. And of course, we made a nice connection. And so later, when we decided to make dances about their jobs, he's one of the people who stepped up. and. Um, that's pretty amazing.
is dark. Working with non-artists has to affect your relationship with when you return to working with professional mm. dancers again, right? It does, but you know, you're, I'm the better for it. Oh, yes. Totally the better for it. For one thing, there are a lot of methods and ways of working that have be become clearer. Mm. Uh, so, as I mentioned in the, yesterday in the talk, you know, when you're in, the, uh, you're in a place like Children's Hospital, um, it turns out your skills are developed. Or the work I'm doing with scientists right now, you know, my dance, the, the, uh, one of the um, standards in dance is the level of abstraction that a piece might hold. And if you grow up in most, most dance academies today, you, you would not make anything that would be um, somewhat literal or concrete. It would all be abstract. You'd jump to the abstraction right away. Mm -hmm. But if you're working, say, with a scientist, and the scientist needs to know what something looks like, he's trying to understand how the cell, he can't quite see it, so he's working with dancers to help him see how the cell does this or that. Suddenly, you're in a situation where it's okay to be completely expressive, almost literal. Mm -hmm. And you learn skills from that that you can bring back into the studio that you may want to use or no, not, depending. And that's, that is one of the great things to me about it is the, the challenge is push the field. And then I can, I, I have um, the rehearsal process with the professional dances is where I get to synthesize all that, mm -hmm. think about it, see, weigh it out, and push it. Um, speaking of scientists, you took dancers to uh, CERN? I did. <laughs> it was so Actually, one dancer and one videographer. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it was incredible. And you did? We, we were so, in the tunnel. Really? This is before they were finished? And We actually used the footage in the piece. It's pretty amazing. It's really beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they were really they were really excited about it. And, you know, since we've been there, they've uh, there's a woman there now who's running an artist residency program, and artists are uh, requesting to be able to be there. And now there are a million stories at CERN to be told. I mean, it's oh, yes. too, you know, it's really too bad that they. I mean, that they, they, there's so much to talk about. Yeah, it was very interesting. I loved it. Quantum physics is just a very ripe metaphor for so many things. So in our world. much. <laughs> that's that's exactly right. And the pieces. And in fact, that piece is actually probably more abstract and more mysterious than almost anything I've ever made. I thought it was just a very elevated discussion about art, mm -hmm. and I was glad to hear it. Thank you. So, you've had a very busy week on the, on yeah. the campus this week. Yeah. And you've been meeting with lots of different groups yes. of people. It was like an excuse to bring people together. So in every single meeting we had or, wor or workshop we did, there were people from a lot of different disciplines, and half the fun was watching them sort of connect with each other. Because you know people want to do that, but it's hard to do. You're busy, you go, you know, you do your work, and even though you say, I want to meet that person over in English, or gee, I'd like to meet that scientist, it's really hard to do, but it just was happening. So that was really fun. It was great to see. And there's a lot of reasons we don't do that, right? There's a lot of barriers that we put between ourselves and our colleagues around campus. Well, I think not just campuses, but everywhere. But, you know, I think the, uh, the whole way in which we've professionalized, and there's a good things about professionalization. It's mm -hmm. interesting. It's important. But sometimes those very things that standardize an occupation or a way of thinking become barriers. It becomes a club that you can't get into. Or if you're in it, you can't get out of to go find people who might be like-minded uh, for some other reason on campus. So yes, I think, it's, I think it takes a lot. And I think on camp, campuses are really feeling this now uh, all over the country as the questions people are asking are too complex. Uh, and the issues we face are just too complex to solve with a single discipline. So if we're really going to not just teach young people new ways of thinking, but actual strategies for change, they're going to have to reach across all those barriers. It's interesting. It took a hurricane to get the Republicans and Democrats to look together at something like climate change. That's right. I mean, that is, it's ridiculous. It wasn't on the map before that. what it took. Right. And what, is, what are the television showing day, all day, all night is, you know, uh, Christie and Obama. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. It wasn't being discussed at all during the campaign up until this point. Mm -hmm. um, wh when you come on campus, do you come on? Do you feel like your perception is as a dancer or an academic? How do people perceive you when they're going to they have a meeting with uh, Liz Lerman? Yeah, you know, it's, it's fun. I know they don't think of me as an academic. That I, right. that much I think they wouldn't, just because I'm not one. Mm -hmm. um, although I enjoy teaching on campuses, I. Um, with the exception of one semester at Harvard, I've always just really been like a visitor for a week or two or three or something like that. 
So I don't think they do. I think that it's interesting because mostly I wish they would think of me as a choreographer, but people can barely make the, the stretch from dancer to choreographer. It's, oh, what are you talking about? And then if you think choreographer, it's hard to think what I mean by choreographer, which is bigger than just moving dancers' bodies around on the stage. I think when they spend time with me, some of the other ways they may describe it is sometimes a philosopher, sometimes activist, mm -hmm. um, sometimes um, uh, maybe um, just a new way to think about an artist. Although I don't think I'm behaving in a new way. I feel like I'm actually behaving in a kind of deep, long tradition of artists and cultures. But I think a lot of people might see it as a little bit different. I know that um, what was very gratifying here was to see, um, you know, work with the dance students and just see their minds just popping with possibilities. It was really exciting to watch. Because I imagined you as a dancer and as a choreographer coming on. I knew you were going to work with dance students. But I wonder if it's more neutral ground for people from other disciplines, from the sciences, let's say, or humanities, where they might be a little more open to some of the ideas you're talking about. Well, I actually, you know, you raise an interesting point. I think a lot of times it's easier to collaborate and do projects with people who are not like you. Mm -hmm. Like in some ways it's harder for, say, dance and theater or for music and dance or, than it is, say, for theater and science or for dance and engineering. And I don't know why that is. It's something maybe about the attractiveness of something that's so different mm -hmm. and you're so outside your normal way of being that maybe normal things like competition or even aesthetics can't possibly come up. It, it changes the picture. That was one of the reasons why I love dancing with old people is that as soon as you put old, old people on stage, it would force an audience to say to itself, well, I guess it just can't be about how high people's legs are going to go <laughs> because they're not going to go very high. These people are 90 years old, you oh, know, right. the legs are going to go like this. So it, I think it forced people to say, what else is there to think about? And that's when I felt like I had a chance to expand people's ideas about dance. I thought it was, it was interesting in your lecture yesterday when you refer to, as you just did, old people, yeah. that you don't look for a euphemism. You just call them old people. Yeah, it's really humanizing in a way. <laughs> I've been taken to task for that over the years, but I just can't, even now I'm old. It's like it doesn't, it, I know the elderly or the wise ones. or the, Right. No, I know, like it. It's better. I know. It is much better. It's much better. Well, we're talking about young people, so we're talking right. about old people. Right. Right. Yeah, thank you for noticing. I, I like the way that uh, they also, in the, the examples that you showed, the video that you shared with us, they take the dance just fine as a mm. form of expression. It's really true. Older people, you know, this was one that there were so many stereotypes that I broke in my own head, and then I feel like by using older people in the work, it broke for large, larger numbers of people, too. But um, uh, for just so many of them that, that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, for example. That, that is completely wrong. Old people are like at a place in their life where they say, you know, okay, I played by the rules my entire life. Guess what? Mm -hmm. Not now. All right. And you know, what? Right. what, you're going to laugh at me? What, what? You know, I found a lot of, a lot, right from the get go, people very curious. Then, of course, if you challenge people, if you challenge them and you expect more of them, I know this sounds crazy, but when I first started to work with older people, if you looked at what they were doing for arts stuff, they had handed them like scissors we used to get in kindergarten, you know? <laughs> they really were infant, they were made infants. So if right. you come in and you say, I expect the most from you, right. there's some amazing things happen. Right, which right. Which proves to be true for anybody, not just older people. If you hold high expectations for people, they will rise to them. I've thought about this, about how um, we think of poetry as kind of a dying art form. I think we've completely lost the language of dance. But the way you talked about it yesterday, it is something that we can regain. Oh, I completely feel that we can, partly by expanding what we mean by it. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the incidents I gave yesterday where I talked about, you know, there was a time people danced and the crops grew. Right. I mean, taking it back to its really ancient roots. Um, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't know, of course, what that dance was like, but I, you see people using movement at the most intense times of their existence. As I was describing the story about my uncle and the way he danced right to the end of his life. Uh, I, I, uh, I, and a recent death in my family, watching um, the way in which everybody was holding everybody, it was just this most amazing sequence of, um, were it not for what we were crying over, absolutely beautiful mm -hmm. uh, unification of people. I think, um, you know, why are people afraid to, to dance? I have two things. 
people are afraid of their bodies. Right. And this is, you Certainly. know, this is a long uh, historical part of the American continent. Uh, we did do a project in New Haven, working um, on the New Haven Green, which is where the pilgrims, who were even more puritanical than the pilgrims that landed <laughs> in <laughs> Boston, and they migrated. They were so puritanical, they had to separate. They came to New Haven, and you were not allowed to dance on the green. It would, you know, you would die. And so we did. <laughs> we had a thousand people out one night dancing on the green to kind of honor the past, but to say, hey. It's, it doesn't have to be like this. So, so part of it is that long confusion we have over our bodies. And the second part of it is a confusion that a lot of people have about dance. It's pretty much about the, the steps. Can't got to get the steps right. right. Steps are just one part of dancing. There's right. so much more to it. So many more possible ways that people can be, as you saw in, in the video that we showed of the guy who was the, uh, worked at the shipyard. We are hemmed in by that idea that we need to be perfect, though. And dancing is intimidating. It's worse than standing in front of a painting you don't understand yeah. if you don't know the steps. But they're similar in a way. I think the, the issue of perfection is really a problem. Where in the world did that come from? Because of, you know, we pay, now we do, and the academy and other places pay lip service to the idea that mistakes are okay, mm -hmm. failure is okay. Actually, it's hard. It's hard when you fail and you make mistakes. You're embarrassed, you're hurt, you feel bad. You know? But we have skills for getting past that. And if you, if you are in charge of your own, what it is you're trying to do, you can plow the mistakes back into what you're making and do something better with it. So the perfection part, though, is really troublesome. I don't know why we, we feel so strong we have to be perfect and why in the arts that has taken such a... Uh, you know, so the, for example, in music, the, like for blind auditions, where mm. these students who've spent what their entire life learning to play go into a blind audition, right. and it's only about the sound. It's not about the person in relationship to the sound. It's not yeah. about what that person looks like when they're playing. It's not about the passion of that person. It is just the purity of the sound. I don't get that. We all accept it as a convention, too. Yeah. And, but I'm glad you used the word convention because that's all it is. That's it's all not it is. tradition. Right. It's not tradition. It's a convention that happens to be in existence right now, and I think that's what we have to change. And this is a place that we've, we've gotten ourselves to devolved, if you will, on the basis of who knows what or we, this, this perfective idea. I think possibly it's measurable. Mm -hmm. That sometimes we we want to use. score ourselves in some way. So we first of all we choose perfection in a way that lets us measure it. So in dance it might be a certain kind of technique. Literally, as I said before, how high does your leg go? How right. high do you jump? How big is your stretch? Right. These things are somewhat measurable, right. as opposed to the immeasurable things, which of course include flaws. Okay. And <laughs> what what makes you really beautiful or really great is actually the the flaw in relationship to the perfected person you're trying to become. What is the fundamental nature of gravity? What holds the universe together? Why should I bother? Is there a unified theory of everything? Are there other dimensions? Where do we come from? Where are we? I was reading a little bit about you and uh, one of the things I read said, uh, Liz has, has wrestled with the death, of, the death of her mother, Judaism, and bonsai trees in their gardeners. Yeah. <laughs> it's like one of these things don't fit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I am interested in subject matter. And, and I think partly that interest is what makes universities right now interested in having me come visit. It's because that it's the searching around the subject matter and using creative process to understand things that are difficult. I think universities are looking for more things like that, partly because students aren't going to sit still and listen to lectures, and partly because the, the faculty themselves are beginning to see that these intersections are useful. So whether it's something as, as sort of square as embodied knowledge, which is, you know, figure out how to be DNA in your body, which is one way of working, but I think a more complex one was a project I did at Wesleyan where I partnered with an astronomer, a physicist, and a cosmologist. 
they presented the subject matter, the content to the students, but I presented the research methods. So mm. the course was, in, the kids learned the subject matter entirely through creative process. It was pretty interesting. And they did fine. They learned a lot. <laughs> they learned a lot of the standard stuff, and then they learned a lot of the unstandard stuff. And, that was, and they asked very interesting questions. Of course. And that's the thing that I, I think is really important. So that, that's part of why I think universities are turning more to the arts and the kinds of stuff Mark's doing here, where people are looking for these cross-disciplinary things. Like the environmentalists, who I sat down with on Monday. I mean, they have a big problem, the environmentalists. You know, they really have to get people to change their minds. Mm -hmm. Now, how are they going to do that? And I mean, I think they need the imagination. I think they need uh, passion and commitment from people. They need practice. People are going to have to practice new ways. I don't see how they can do that without the arts. That's exactly right. What do you think uh, the university, the physical university environment looks like 15 years from now? Yeah, well, you know, I think the, um, the ongoing issue that you hear when people complain about cross-discipline is are you going to be dilettantes and all of that. So one thing I like, the University of Illinois has a post-genomic institute where they built a building, Every, the chemists are here, everybody, you know, and the biologists are here, and everybody's in their home, their offices are here. But when they have a question they want to solve, they go to the post-genomic institute and they work it out there. Wow. So maybe there are pods around the campus where people know that they can go to gather for these kinds of things. Right. And maybe those, some of those, maybe those pods have an emphasis, like an arts emphasis or a healing emphasis, mm. you know, and maybe all the people concerned with healing might, you still have your home, you still, you go back to, you know, where you live in your chemistry world because we know that chemicals, you know, our chemical makeup is a big part of how we're going to heal ourselves. But there's no reason why the chemist and the dancer can't meet in the healing pod or the this pod, you Healing know? is an interesting word. I think it makes us uncomfortable. We need it, and it makes us very uncomfortable. Why is that? Well, you know, I didn't like the word for a long time because it feels, it's new agey, and it sounds, right. it sounds unrigorous to me. <laughs> right. um, and it sounds just a little bit, um, I guess, flaky, mm -hmm. I would say. Uh, but what, what um, so what we could do is we could say, well, what, what do we want to name this place over here? And maybe we're wrong to call it healing. Maybe it's got four sides to the building, and one side says healing, and one side says uh, fitness, and one side says, um, you know, um, uh, living into living to 150, and one side says uh, taking care of your family to make sure everybody is okay. I mean, then people enter even the side of the building that makes sense to them, but once they're inside, that overlap, like that. Mm -hmm. So I think what we want to do, I think when you hear healing, you think, oh, it's not going to be expert. Mm. But, yeah. You know, um, John Borsa, who came with me on this particular trip here, you know, he talks about how you can become excellent in synthesis, and that maybe one of the things that's going to be happening at these pods is that we're going to find ways to become excellent in synthesis, and then unsynthesize, go back to you, your root, your home. Right. We were talking today, Mark and, Mark and John and I, about um, and what kind of courses you might offer in interdisciplinarity, which I guess is the term, and I was saying <laughs> that, you know, it doesn't matter if it's cross-discipline or not. You need people to know how to find their voice. You need people to be able to stand up for themselves. It's like I started my lecture about my mom. You, 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 you need to know your voice, and, you're, you know, and then you need to have the skills to cross over into other people's worlds to be respectful of what you find, to look and look for connections and look for disparities. I mean, you need both those things. So We're true. gonna have to train our people to be able to do that. 